On the occasion of your New Year's celebration, my fellow Americans and I extend our very best wishes for the prosperity and well-being of the government and the people of Vietnam. In your struggle against aggressive forces of communism, the sacrifices that you have willingly made, the courage you have shown, the burdens you have endured, have been a source of inspiration to people all over the world. Let me assure you of our continued assistance in the development of your capabilities to maintain your freedom and to defeat those who wish to destroy that freedom. We in America sincerely hope that the year of the tiger will see peace come again to Vietnam. We know that courage and dedication to peace and freedom will prevail and that prospects for Vietnam will brighten during the coming year. And Lee, we look forward confidently with you to the day when your country will again be at peace, united, prosperous, and free. There we have President Kennedy in February of 1962 in a New Year speech to the people of South Vietnam. This, almost exactly a year after his inauguration, gives us the impression of a president invested in the future of that country. He says he is confident the country will one day be united, be free, and that his government is going to maintain their assistance in the fight against communism. I want to begin the episode here with this speech and compare it to the diary of a younger John F. Kennedy. Ten years earlier, still a congressman in 1951, when he himself visited what was then still French Indochina, although the struggle over that dominion was very much raging. Kennedy had an appreciation for history, and he could see that what was going on in Vietnam was a struggle between colonialism and nationalism, even though the Viet Minh's benefactors were the Chinese and the Soviets. And for France, well, they had the US. But Kennedy still had the prescience to ask a US minister and a French military commander in a meeting, well, why should the bulk of the Vietnamese people be expected to join the struggle to keep their country part of the French Empire? What would be their motivation? And this question annoyed those he asked it to. Later in the trip, Kennedy wrote in his diary, we are more and more becoming colonialists in the minds of the people. And in a radio address after this tour, he stated that in Indochina, we have allied ourselves to the desperate effort of the French regime to hang on to the remnants of an empire. And that there is no broad general support of the native Vietnam government among the people of that area, for it is a puppet government. Now, there have been different errors of history about Kennedy, from the so-called Camelot views of a handsome, brilliant young politician that would have led the world into peace if it weren't for his assassination, to the revisionist view that he was a rather pathetic, sickly, lucky, drug-addicted womanizer, to some kind of accommodation of the two schools in recent decades. But these views don't discount the fact that he was at least smart. He knew what was happening in a doomed French Indochina. He could see the validity of the Viet Minh's nationalism, as opposed to the French colonial vision for that region. He knew that the US was being viewed in similar terms due to their support of the French. And yet, in the years leading to his death, Kennedy will increase the US presence in Vietnam over and over again. So what had changed? And more importantly, is why. This gets to the heart of what historian Frederick Lojeval calls the paradox of Vietnam. Why did Kennedy get into a situation in Vietnam that he privately knew might not be crucial to US security? This was someone who didn't take the domino theory that seriously. Someone that seemed to know that the US would just represent another big white country seeking to colonize the local area, in the eyes of many of its population. And it isn't just him. Kennedy's vice president, Lyndon Johnson, will also travel to Vietnam in the first half of 1961, 
to report on the situation there. Remember, this is the president whose name will most be associated with the so-called Vietnam War, often even called Johnson's War. He will put the first real combat troops on the ground, he will order the first bombings of Hanoi. But, in a similarly prescient manner, he reflects in a memorandum to Kennedy after his tour in 1961, quote, We should make clear, in private, that barring an unmistakable and massive invasion of South Vietnam from the north, we have no intention of employing combat US forces in Vietnam or using even naval or air support, which is the first step in that direction. If the Vietnamese government, backed by a three-year liberal aid program, cannot do this job, then we had better remember the experience of the French, who wound up with several hundred thousand men in Vietnam, and were still unable to do it. Before we take any such plunge, we had better be sure we are prepared to become bogged down, chasing irregulars and guerrillas over the rice fields and jungles of Southeast Asia, while our principal enemies... China and the Soviet Union, stand outside the fray and husband their strength. End quote. Johnson is the guy who will publicly say that no Din Ziem is like the Churchill of Asia, but will privately say, shit man, he's the only boy we got out there. But it goes further back too, before Kennedy, while the Eisenhower administration tried to figure out how they would keep the French afloat in Vietnam, a national intelligence estimate in August of 1954 stated that, quote, Although it is possible that the French and Vietnamese, even with firm support from the US and other powers, may be able to establish a strong regime in South Vietnam, we believe that the chances for this development are poor, and, moreover, that the situation is more likely to deteriorate progressively over the next year. It is even possible at some time during the next two years, the South Vietnam government could be taken over by elements that would seek unification with the North, even at the expense of communist domination. If the scheduled elections are held in 1956, and if the Viet Minh does not prejudice its political prospects, it will almost certainly win. End quote. Vietnam a dreaded war in the jungles that had already been lost by the French. One of the many journalists who would make a mark during the war, David Halberstam, once reflected on his time reporting on it. Quote, the problem was trying to cover something every day as news, when in fact the real key was that it was all derivative of the French Indochina War, which is history. So you really should have had a third paragraph in each story which should have said, all of this is shit and none of this means anything because we are in the same footsteps as the French and we are prisoners of their experience. End quote. So how do we explain this lumbering into one of the most widely acknowledged bad moves of US foreign policy? Can we look at it purely in the containment lens? Does the domino theory explain it all, or the hubris of US experts and military men and presidents? A fear of losing prestige worldwide, domestically, or even in relation to the careers of those who pressed ahead? A kind of tragic, sunk cost fallacy that will cost millions of lives. Trying to get a handle on this is not easy. Thankfully, we've spent hours already looking at the circumstances that have got us this far. Necessary details. As it's impossible to answer the question of how the US got so entangled into the potentially foolish endeavour to contain communism in what used to be French Indochina, without knowing about, well, French Indochina. Much of this project has been about internationalising the conflicts in Vietnam and that is mostly done in order to lead us to what will happen in Cambodia. The wars in Vietnam, in this show's perspective, are being attempted to be told through, for the majority of the time, a Cambodian lens. But these other parts of the historical hurricane have always required at least some level of explanation, particularly this one, the most crucial weather pattern that will contribute 
to the devastation in Cambodia. And this is a different variation on that theme. This is something else. This is US involvement in Vietnam. And it's another thing entirely to try and tackle one of the most analysed topics of history in this format. I mean, it must have been almost three years ago in one of the earliest episodes of this podcast that when quote-unquote Vietnam first came up, I felt that I should reference this gargantuan topic through an old Time Life commercial with the kid at the memorial and his father and he's asking, what's Vietnam? And the narration says, what's Vietnam? A question a child might ask, but not a childish question. Here we might want to change that to why Vietnam? A simple question to ask, but one without a simple answer. There have been different eras of historiography on this question too, from the orthodox views that were present even before the war itself was over, largely reflecting the anti-war movement and begging the question of the morality and justification of the war, to the revisionists, who tried to place the Vietnam War in context of the Cold War, and argued that the US role was necessary to some extent, even if it had not been executed properly. And in the last couple of decades, a new movement in this historical topic to focus on Vietnamese perspectives of the war has emerged. Now, as a way of showing those different perspectives, look at how movies that portray the Vietnam War changed. Compare, say, Full Metal Jacket, Apocalypse Now, or Platoon with, say, Rambo 2. And compare that with, say, it's not the best example, but Heaven and Earth, which is an Oliver Stone movie, but one from a Vietnamese woman's perspective. I take all of these to be important histories. Not the movies, but the different eras of history. I mean, the movies are good too, I guess, and, you know, part of how Western culture has digested something as complicated as the Vietnam War. The different ways this history have been looked at have often been done so primarily through American eyes. I mean, even calling it the Vietnam War is, well, indicative of that. But as this intro begins to go long, I want to just centre us on what this episode is an attempt to do. First of all, it's the second part in a series about the path to the Second Indochina War, or the Vietnam War, or the American War, or the unbroken pause in a much longer Vietnamese civil war. This episode is about the US in particular, and how in a sense they got stuck, or stuck themselves in, and how successive presidents found themselves, to borrow the metaphor of Frederick Logeval, like doctors taking care of a dying patient, just keeping the patient alive long enough until their shift ended, and the next person would have to deal with it. Hi everyone, welcome back to In the Shadows of Utopia. Not much of an intro here as I consider this episode, the next one, and the one that preceded this as one big one, all broken up. That being said, thank you so much to everyone who supports the show on Patreon and has made donations via PayPal. Incredibly helpful and makes me extremely proud to receive. Worth mentioning as well that at the moment about a quarter of everything that comes in goes to the Cambodian Children's Fund, a great charity doing great things that I've seen firsthand. I want to remind everyone as well, if you do like this show, please take the time to leave a review or at least a rating. I read every single one of them. Now, before we get back to exploring the story here, I just want to say again that these sojourns into the areas outside of Cambodian history 
are done in the spirit of filling in important gaps in an international story that will affect what happens in Cambodia. Necessarily, they lack some of the detail that the Cambodian history portions contain. Uh, One of the biggest goals I've had with this project is for someone, once it's over, to read a book about Cambodia or the Khmer Rouge and, well, let's just say that I mean, most serious books on the subject contain a certain level of assumed knowledge. They might just mention something like, I don't know, Lenin, and you're supposed to know what they are talking about, or Geneva, or Dien Bien Phu, or the Great Leap Forward. So I've always thought that the reason for diving into these other topics, even at a relatively superficial level, has been to just make sure everyone will be on the same page that everyone has the requisite wider knowledge to fully understand what will happen in Cambodia. As I've said ad nauseum, what happens there should be first and foremost understood through Cambodian history. But the Khmer Rouge nightmare has a lot of other dirty, bloody fingerprints on it. Now, if it sounds like I'm hedging a bit here, it's because, to an extent, I am. One thing about history is the more you learn about it, the more you realise you don't know about it as well. I know enough to know what I don't know. That being said, I'm always conscious of getting the best sources to give you, my dear listener, an accurate and up-to-date understanding of these often complicated themes and events. It's funny, I'm sure many of you listening may have seen the, uh, the, the somewhat recent Ken Burns documentary on Vietnam. It's something like 18 hours long. And even that, hailed by many as a kind of masterpiece, is also criticised for not being rounded enough in its depictions or, or giving enough time to certain events and perspectives. So in this episode, primarily concerned with the US frame, I want to remind people that this is not the only way of looking at what happened, but a necessary part of the series overall. And as we go through the content here, perhaps it's worth saying where I stand on this topic. And I think what the best way to tell this story is, so one of the things with this kind of history, I mean, especially when you have different errors of history on one subject, is a kind of accommodation of the different viewpoints. I think that's the most logical thing to do. I count myself in the camp of thinking that America's war in Vietnam was a tragedy, a needless mistake, and it will cost millions of lives. I also think that within the context in which it was fought, you can see reasons, however foolish in hindsight, for why it was fought. I also welcome the new Vietnamese perspectives on the war that seek to soften the focus purely on the actions of the US and include those people living in the country that they were fighting a civil war in. And if we are to open that conversation up to the wider story, the Cambodian story, I similarly count myself as one of those who can ask, well, if there was no American war in Vietnam, would the Khmer Rouge have come to power in the way that they did? That would be unlikely. But to go that extra step and to claim that therefore everything that the Khmer Rouge did was somehow the fault of the US... Well, that seems to exclude the decades of history that predated the US being so involved. Where do the French lay in that picture? Where does China, the Vietnamese, or indeed the Cambodians themselves that comprised the Khmer Rouge, when and where do they come into focus? Again, uh, apologies for going on and on here. It's just that I know people get to this part of the story with a certain amount of absorbed perspectives. And while I don't want to undermine that, I feel it's always worth bringing a very wide view to something that is so complicated. All right, enough of that. I will also just quickly mention here before we properly get started that I've updated the Dramatis Personae part of the website, and I know a lot of people like having that kind of visual accompaniment, so a few more characters and their faces are now in that, and you can just follow the link in the show's description to head there and have a look at it, if you so please. 
So something that will often come up, and I see this in discussions of the Khmer Rouge a lot as well, is that people will just kind of say, oh, the Vietnam War? Oh yeah, that started in, what, 1965? And they'll kind of go from there. Likewise, in Cambodia, it will often start on the 17th of April, 1975. Like, these things just come out of nowhere. And as we are, what, 20-something episodes into this, I hope that my addressing of these events is coming across in at least a slightly longer view of history. Although I will confess to having started this series with the events around the evacuation of Phnom Penh, but just to, uh, I don't know, lure you in with a fascinating part of the story before you realised it was a trick and you would need to wait four years to find out what happened next. Now, wasn't my fault, I should say. I really did think I would have this whole thing finished in about a year. But that endeavour being demonstrably not the case, and now that we're focusing on the US in Vietnam and the region of Southeast Asia now, I think we should at least just have a little recap. I, I won't go too far back, but I think the Second World War is a good place to start just to frame what I think are some very crucial years heading into the early 1960s. If you recall, back during the last phase of the Second World War, the OSS, which would eventually become the CIA, was actively helping the Viet Minh against the Japanese. At the end of the war, however, the US sort of turned their back on them as the French re-established control of Indochina. Although, nominally opposed to the continuation of colonialism, containment of communism was a higher priority, as was keeping the French happy. By 1950, as the French war with the Viet Minh had escalated, again, the US administration did not recognise Ho Chi Minh's Democratic Republic of Vietnam, and the National Security Council became even more concerned with the spread of communism and containing that spread. This has to be seen in the context of as we discussed, the view that China had been lost to communism. Significant aid was given to the French war effort, and it was acknowledged that thereafter, the US would be involved in the developing strategy of Vietnam. By 1953, as the war went on, the National Security Council said that the loss of Indochina to communism would be, quote, critical to the security of the US. Later, this evolved into the idea that the French losing in such a way that gave keys to the communists would necessitate direct US military involvement. Remember just how much the US paid for that war by the end as well. I think it was upwards of 80%. They were fighting that war in all but troops on the ground. And we should also recall just how close Eisenhower came to intervening at Tien Bien Phu. And short of direct intervention... Even the threat of this was used as a kind of hanging sword over the negotiations at Geneva. And those negotiations, the Geneva Accords, were considered a disaster by the US National Security Council. And along with the ideas about a Southeast Asian treaty organisation, like an equivalent to NATO in, in Asia, policy of the US toward the country that would become South Vietnam beneath the 17th parallel, basically revolved around creating a stable government with substantial US aid and military training that would become a viable bulwark to the spread of communism in the region. I realise perhaps I've made things sound more complicated than they are at points, and perhaps with good reason, but this could also be thought of in rather simple terms as well. This is the story of a slow escalation. It will involve multiple angles and factors and catalysts, but it's a a story of a giant slowly walking into quicksand, and with each step finding it harder and harder to walk backwards. So with the stage being set from a US perspective of, hey, this is our problem now, and quite a bit is going to hinge on what we do in South Vietnam, I want to start the story in a little bit more detail then and there, because this is when Colonel Edward Lansdale, a very interesting character and sort of, well, crucial to the early US-South Vietnam relationship, it takes some interesting turns even from the outset. Lansdale, a CIA operative, heads a small team of Americans known as the Saigon Military Mission, SMM. This uh, operation is undertaken in a tumultuous state. This is just as 
Ziem has become prime minister, and when this new country below the 17th parallel resembles, according to historian Edward Miller, an ungovernable tangle of rival armies, parties, and factions. Handily, we actually have Lansdale's own report on the activities of the SMM, written a few months after the uh, mission was complete. Among other things, the mission will sabotage the Hanoi Railroad for the victorious Viet Minh taking the city off of the French. They will intervene in a coup attempt against Siem by one of the South Vietnamese generals. Just, you know, general CIA stuff. But stuff that was perhaps key to getting South Vietnam under Siem up and going. But what is interesting about this formerly secret account is, well, a few things. The first is the kind of optimism, particularly when we know how this is all going to play out eventually. Here we really have the America is good, we can do no wrong, and we are helping attitude. There is also the way that it's written, which is quite dramatic, and I'll share some of that with you in just a moment. But I mean, as an example, Lansdale writes about himself in the third person, Kind of a George likes spicy chicken moment, which I found kind of funny. But yeah, this is just, for for instance, this is how he kicks off his secret CIA report on the activities of the SMM. And forgive some of the flavor I give this, but, quote, This is the condensed account of one year in the operations of a Cold War combat team, written by the team itself in the field, little by little, in moments taken as the members could. The team is known as the Saigon Military Mission. The field is Vietnam. There are other teams in the field. American, French, British, Chinese, Vietnamese, Viet Minh, and others. Each has its own story to tell. This is ours. End quote. Amazing, right? Almost want to put the Law and Order theme song at the end of that, like, each has its own story to tell. This is ours. But remember, this isn't a novel. This is a secret CIA report. Anyway, skipping ahead a few paragraphs. Quote, The Saigon military mission received some blows from allies and the enemy in this atmosphere, as we worked to help stabilise the government and to beat the Geneva timetable of communist takeover in the north. However... We did beat the timetable. The government did become stabilised. The free Vietnamese, he capitalises free, are now becoming unified and learning how to cope with the communist enemy. We are thankful that we had a chance to help in this work in a critical area of the world to be positive and constructive in a year of doubt. End quote. So again, here it's very sincere, isn't it? And it does place the CIA team in an important role in the setting up of the South Vietnamese government under Xiam, and giving some credence to the idea that, although an oversimplification, the country of South Vietnam was in some measure a creation of the United States. At least in their eyes, anyway. Lansdale then goes on to describe a psychological warfare campaign, a PSYOP where rumours were to be spread about Chinese communist armies having uh, raped girls in a Viet Minh village, intended to stoke fears of Chinese occupation of Vietnam if the Viet Minh had control over the entire country. And the adventures of Edward Lansdale don't end there, but following his SMM mission, he kind of becomes a close confidant of Xiam and a vital interlocutor between the regime and the US. But what I hope that little insight into the early days gets across is a some of the optimism about the project the US was embarking upon and b well this kind of this attitude that the Geneva Accords were almost like an annoyance and that the project simply needed to be get a stable regime in the south there were doubts here and there that Ziem would be the right man at the top of that regime but after he had established his authority well it was easier for policymakers in the US to sort of just go along with him too. Once the constitution was set in place in 1956, and after the date set for the voting uh, the Geneva Accords set out came and went, the US then went about just pouring aid into the South. In that year, 1956, 
American economic and security assistance totaled around $300 million, which, I don't know, using some rough calculations, is something like $3 billion in 2020s dollars. Uh, most of this is going toward military aid. Again, we see that even though there was some vague talk about needing political solutions to upcoming problems, I think it's something like 78% of the cash being poured in goes to ZM's military budget, and something like 2% goes to things like developing programs in the areas of health, housing, and community development. Now, again, I don't want to put this case out there that no one knew what they were doing, and it was all a bit, yeah, I guess so. Yes, both ZM and the US were focusing more on creating a strong military presence first and foremost to ward off the potential for North Vietnamese invasion, as well as potential insurgency from communist forces in the South. So, sure, let's modernise the army. Uh, they create what was known as the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, ARVN, Arvin, and under a Lieutenant General Sam Williams, Hangin' Sam, as he was known to be a bit of a hard ass, this effort was going to be undertaken. Now, Logovol characterises Hangin' Sam as someone who was a keen student of guerrilla warfare, who realised that the whole backbone of guerrilla tactics was having the backing of a large amount of the civilian population, aside from getting their weapons and supplies from outside powers that were friendly to that cause. Hang and Sam knew that small, disciplined guerrilla units could tie down much larger conventional forces. He therefore reasoned that in order to defeat a guerrilla force, a superior military is not all that you need. You have to have the people on your side. You have to combat the ideas that the guerrillas are telling them. And, I mean, we can consider this as a kind of holistic approach. And if you're unable to cut off the supplies from outside powers to those guerrillas, well, then no lasting victory will come. It's pretty clever, right? Sure. Except, he also seems quite unable to follow his own advice. He downplays reports of Arvin corruption and evidence that the army was exploiting the very people who they were trying to get to support them, and he also just kind of didn't predict that a southern guerrilla threat would really be the most pressing worry. He was sure that it would be a massive conventional invasion from the North Vietnamese. He therefore advised Ziem to simply bolster conventional forces and not to worry too much about the political reforms. The threat is North Vietnam, rather than those in the South who might turn against you. Advice that won't turn out very helpful. But hopes were that it could work out. And Ziem was going to start getting a lot of support from the US, even the US media and public, as this kind of glowing example of a patriot of freedom, particularly after he visits the US in 1957. President Eisenhower waits at Washington National Airport for the arrival of his own plane, Columbine III, with a highly prized visitor, President Diem of South Vietnam. Diem is only the second visitor the president has gone to meet on arrival. King Saud was the first. The president personally escorts the Vietnamese leader on the traditional review of the honor guard. The red carpet extends all the way to the heart of the capital. Official Washington highly regards this able anti-communist leader who brought his country out of near chaos. Unofficial Washington stands on the sidelines to give its greeting. Xiam arrives in Washington on the 8th of May, 1957 to something similar to a hero's welcome. Eisenhower greets him at the airport, which was a rarity. There were crowds watching the motorcade, military bands. Eisenhower says to him in front of the press, You have exemplified in your part of the world patriotism of the highest order. And for me, this visit marks this shift between, well, there's always just a few doubts in the background of policymakers and the CIA and those in the know, about the prospect of Ziem's regime. But this visit highlights the shift into this is our guy in a very public manner. The Eisenhower administration is making it clear that they have an investment in South Vietnam 
to the wider government, as well as to the American people. There was a kind of, I guess you could say, lobby group uh, called the American Friends of Vietnam, who in my readings for this, it seems that in the past kind of eras of history on this topic, perhaps their influence may have been overstated. But there is certainly what I guess we could term interested parties who are seeking to project an image of the South Vietnamese leader and of the situation in South Vietnam generally as of deep importance to the US. On Diem's visit to Washington, the American Friends of Vietnam had sent a telegram to more than a hundred publishers and editors across the country that Diem must be spoken about in positive tones, accorded the warmest welcome, and the journalists duly obliged. For instance, the New York Times stated that Diem was an Asian liberator, a man of tenacity, of purpose, a stubborn man bent on succeeding, a man whose life, all of it, is devoted to his country and his God. Other papers used similar language. He was a nationalist leader, struggling to stand up against the red tide, a valiant and effective fighter, Vietnam's man of steel, the uh, the Mandarin in a sharkskin suit who's upsetting the Reds' timetable. Logoval suggests that part of this is the incorporation, particularly of Ziem's easily translatable Western characteristics, his dress, his English, his Catholicism, as opposed to Buddhism, his love of freedom. It was a way of looking at the situation in Vietnam through a distinctly Western lens, and again falls into this unfortunate misunderstanding of the situation in Vietnam, as well as a willingness to look the other way when it came to the more problematic aspects of the Ziem regime. To whatever extent that Ziem was being actively sold in a kind of public relations campaign that would be underpinning further involvement of the US in South Vietnam, this idea that it was being done to protect freedom, to protect someone just like us, was underway. Naturally, these kinds of visits of a foreign leader also have their conversations about what one or the other wants or needs, and Ziem is asking for more assistance behind closed doors. And it's there that officials aren't quite as accommodating, saying that the Congress is actually looking to reduce foreign aid rather than increase it. But they assured him that the US was committed to the Ziem regime. Eisenhower concludes one of the dinners they both attend by raising a toast to President Ziem, the Vietnamese people, and the great and lasting friendship between our two countries. Logeval suggests that Ziem's 1957 visit was a huge success. The red carpet had been rolled out for him, Eisenhower had set the tone for all those watching on that Ziem was an example for people everywhere who hate tyranny and love freedom. The press had followed suit, not detailing his authoritarian rule, and I'll, I'll quote Logeval directly here, as a result of Ziem's stay and the fawning coverage it received, America's commitment to Vietnam had been personalised in a way it was never before. This in a culture which, as the saying goes, all politics is personal. A Cold War political commitment made by a comparative handful of elites had become a US public commitment, thereby reinforcing it, deepening it, in a way only dimly visible at the time. The visit crystallised the self-congratulatory perception in the popular mind of No Din Ziem as the lion-hearted fighter, the devout Christian in suit and tie, the miracle man of Asia, fighting off rapacious communists with America's selfless help. End quote. This is occurring just two years after a special envoy to South Vietnam, a General J. Lawton Collins, had come back and expressed the view that, quote, it would be a major error in judgment to continue support a man, Ziem, who has demonstrated such a marked inability to understand the political, economic, and military problems associated with Vietnam, end quote. But, as we had seen, with some not insignificant assistance from the CIA in the shape of Lansdale, Ziem had overcome the rivalries and, in essence, became the man that the US was now going to support. 
And in the wake of Xiam's massively successful trip to the US, and the associated deepening of the relationship between his regime and the US, the aspects of authoritarian rule in South Vietnam would begin to cause a repression of the people that would eventually result in a number of uprisings against the government of South Vietnam. You may recall from the last episode when we discussed the early years of the new South Vietnamese state that not only had Diem accorded himself enough provisos and constitutional amendments to ensure that he could essentially rule via decree, but that his government had also begun to resemble a nepotistic oligarchy. The power resided not in the constitution or some kind of representative government, but increasingly in the family of No Dinh Diem. His brothers, No Dinh Khan, based in Wei, uh, No Dinh Tuk, and especially No Dinh Nu, the president's main political advisor and enforcer, as well as Madame Nu, uh, Ziem's wife. In a rather ham-fisted attempt to secure their own power, and under the presumption that there were conspirators and communists hidden under every rock, not that there were none, mind you, but the regime had enacted a number of policies aimed at eradicating the communists, and then basically anyone else who dared to question the regime by the late 1950s. As we saw, this actually had made a significant impact on the southern communist cells, seeing their numbers drop dramatically by 1959. But these crackdowns had also greatly exacerbated the fear and resentment that many rural residents felt toward the regime. So while the millions of US dollars flowed into South Vietnam, not only did barely a nickel actually help the vast majority of Vietnamese, but even the facade of well-stocked store shelves in Saigon, uh, new scooters scooting about, all this US merchandise and goods, the country simply became a kind of pretend prosperous. Sure, there was a section of the middle class able to capitalise on this, but It was a country completely dependent on outside support. A study by US political scientists at this time, and as quoted by Lojavol in his book, said that South Vietnam is becoming a permanent mendicant, meaning a beggar, and that American aid had built a castle on sand. Xiem had been able to guide the new state to some amount of stability, But as we said in the last episode, this was a guy who had said that all you needed to rule was a military and an administration. His land reform had been a failure. His inability to engage with different groups was becoming more and more of a problem. And his crackdown on communists had cast such a wide net of repression that it had not only led southern cadre like Le Duan to successfully lobby the North to begin supporting a new organization aiming to overthrow Xiem, but had also generally produced amongst the majority of the rural populations the kind of conditions that the communists could easily use to produce hatred against the Xiem regime. In the months after Xiem's trip to the US, South Vietnam gradually fell into a chaos. Now, you may recall, my dear listener, that we did go through some details about this. What would you call it? Backlash against Siam's rule in the last episode. We talked about Le Duan and the gradual moves that were made by other southern communists to begin armed resistance which would culminate in their successful lobbying of the North Vietnamese Politburo to well, what is essentially start setting up an organisation in the South in order to administer and facilitate this political goal. That organisation will be known as the National Liberation Front, NLF, and is better known to us in the West as what they were called by us, which is the Viet Cong. I feel it's necessary to go over this just a little bit once again, as I'm not sure we quite went into some of the context, as well as a few examples of what this... (laughs) 
well, what it looked like. Again, I find that the general understanding of the Vietnam War is often a little bit blurry, particularly in this earliest resumption of armed conflict that, as we've said, is more or less a resumption of the Vietnamese Civil War, which had been going on for decades. Remember, this is not quite as simple as saying that the North Vietnamese invaded the South and then they began fighting. Nor is it as simple as saying that there was a spontaneous uprising against the puppet regime of Xiem and the US. As with much of the details here, it was a kind of gradual escalation. And that escalation, before it was coming from the US, was coming from Vietnamese living in the South that were reacting to increasingly authoritarian rule. Or even more simply, to a government that was not doing a very good job of taking care of them, and could easily be framed as a not true Vietnamese leadership, a continuation of the French colonial dynasty, or, for those open to a communist ideology, a kind of oppressive imperialist regime antithetical to socialism. So yeah, I want to set the scene and then go into some examples of how this earliest stage of the Second Indochina War would be carried out. If we take a kind of very wide-angle lens of this, and this is something that was noticed by US war correspondent Bernard Fall when he had returned to Vietnam in the late 1950s, well, he's a good example here. He had basically noticed the obituaries in the South Vietnamese press were showing an abnormally high death rate of village chiefs. Now, I realise that the word village chief can have a somewhat disorientating meaning when we come at that from a predominantly Western or English-speaking background. But in a rather superficial way, you can imagine a village chief to be a member of the community that almost had a mini-mayoral role. It was an administrative role, almost like a managerial role, but set amongst the backdrop of a regional community or village. It was a link between the government and the populace, particularly in these rural areas where we might recognise life to be somewhat more agrarian in focus. So what Fall had noticed here was that there was this large amount of these people dying, he counted more than 450 over the span of about a year, or more than one per day, and he then made two maps. The first map showing where these village chiefs had died, and the second map showing where there had been an increased anti-governmental activity. In what could make a pretty good visual in a movie, a pretty good scene, it was clear when looking at the two maps side by side that the chiefs had been getting killed and being replaced by those friendly to the growing National Liberation Front. The countryside was beginning to look a little bit like it had during the war with the French. Saigon was becoming surrounded by a slowly growing insurgency. Lodjeval goes into detail about what Bernard Fall had surmised. Quote, The killings were not random. They conformed to a pattern. The victims were village chiefs who had been landlords and were not much loved by the villagers. The insurgents got the double benefit of being Robin Hoods to the local population and putting other village notables on notice that they could be next. When Saigon appointed a new acting village chief, chances were he too would soon be found with a machete in his back or a bullet in his head. How would number three on the list respond? Simple, Fall said. Unless he wanted to die a martyr's death, he'd quietly declare his support to the revolution. And just like that, another village would have gone communist. The change would be invisible to the outsider. Everyday life would go on as before. Government units coming through the village would be greeted courteously, but the insurgents who came through later would get the intelligence and the rice and the use of a US-supplied radio set. The Arvin hadn't been out-fought per se, but out-administered, which in the end would matter even more. <laughs> 
End quote. So, pretty straightforward, right? Again, imagine that map next to map discovery in a kind of, well, it could be lots of different movies. The ones that come to mind might be that kind of disaster movie. You know, a classic trope being the scientist or the journalist or some kind of expert who, you know, late one night or whatever it might be, makes this startling discovery. They no doubt have an ex-wife or an estranged child or something like that, which will be relevant to the plot. But in the meantime, they take their discovery to the, I don't know, mayor or some kind of authority or the president, and their discovery is brushed off for some reason or another. Oh, you're crazy. Do you know how damaging it would be if something like this got out? We don't want to start a panic. These kinds of things. In this case, Fall does take his theory to a South Vietnamese minister. And in some vague similarity to how this might play out in a movie, the conversation went something like this. Your Excellency, you are in trouble in Vietnam. Do you know that? Fall asks the minister. The minister replies, yes, I know that. And Fall says, well, did you tell President Ziem? And the minister replies, Nobody can tell President Ziem we are in trouble. He believes we are doing fine. Well, do the Americans know? The minister shakes his head. I don't think so. We will return in a moment to, you know, who knew what and how much. But I wanted to start here as it gives us this way into thinking about how this was beginning to play out. Sort of one by one, each village falling and this slow, growing surrounding of the ZM regime in the darkness, in the shadows. But I want to take our attention to what that looked like from those living in the villages as well. In the last episode, we talked about some of the, well, I guess we could say policies, that ZM was using in order to, I guess, in his and his family's eyes, protect the regime from dissent and subterfuge. There was a general anti-communist decree, and that was followed up with something called the 1059 law. This one was the real wide net one. Any kind of law that has a provision for a potential death sentence for anyone committing or attempting to commit crimes infringing upon the security of the state. Yeah, that's a law that's going to be liable to uh, excess. What this meant in practice is that there were special roving courts that could accuse, without right of appeal, anyone even suspected of wrongdoing, and naturally could be used to extract bribes or favours or, you know, you can imagine. This is where we get a real picture of the kind of fear that an average person living in rural or urban South Vietnam could be subjected to. The difficulty of living under this regime. You're just trying to live your life when some official of some description comes up and threatens life in prison or death if you don't play along in some capacity. Even the most staunch non-communist might get a bit sick of a government willing to go that far to intimidate the population into subservience. Again, something designed to completely weed out communism inadvertently sows the seeds for more resentment of the government and a willingness for someone to do something to force some kind of change in that direction. One resident of Maito province, who apparently had no connection to the revolution before the 1059 rule, said that because the ZM regime was so willing to kill people in this arbitrary way, well, it blew life into the anti-government movement and led to renewed fighting. It was around this time too that the relocation of peasants into these kinds of fortified areas where they were cut off from their previous village just to ensure that they would not be easily courted by the insurgents was resurrected. And like so many times when we've seen this come up previously and will again see its use intensify, the link between these people and their land and their ancestors is so strong. So to do this is an utter disgrace for them and sure to really offend these people deeply, particularly when the promises of living in these fortified communes, like access to social services and a range of amenities, was rarely actually delivered upon. Eventually, the CIA 
would say that these relocations, quote, catalyzed the most widespread and dangerous anti-government of Vietnam sentiment, end quote. So, again, we are building here a picture of a rural populace completely being neglected. 90% of the population falls into this rural classification. The shelves in Saigon having Coca-Cola isn't going to mean much to them, is it? Very quickly, we can see the most general view that someone in this category might have had, which is basically that Ziem, as we've said before, is just a continuation of the French, that he's not taking care of them, that he was only being propped up by a new colonial master, and that the true nationalists were anyone but Ziem, that the war of resistance had never ended. As the anti ZM resistance became more organised under the banner of the National Liberation Front, as more capable cadres made their way south, many of those who fought in the Viet Minh and had experience doing, well, what was going to function really as the same thing again, the insurgency itself ramped up too. For instance, beginning in early 1960, in Ban Tre province around the Mekong Delta, an area which had been a Viet Minh stronghold in the French War, efforts to completely eradicate the communists had more or less worked, but even pockets of those who did remain eventually regrouped and began causing havoc for the regime once again. Nguyen Thai Din, a widow whose husband had died at Peol of Condor, the prison that I think we mentioned way back, basically the French sent anyone causing them trouble there, it's like an island, Many Viet Minh would come out of this island prison quite hardened to the cause, and some Khmer were sent there too and have similar experiences. I believe it was one of the monks associated with the Umbrella Revolt who ended up dying in prison there, and basically becoming a martyr for the independence movement. But in any case, Nguyen Thi Dinh became a fierce revolutionary and managed to rally support by organising protests and instructing women on how to confront government troops. Lojavol states, quote, She taught them signals for when to disperse and when to stand their ground in the village square. She pleaded for weapons, and when told none were available, proceeded anyway, with plans to stage an uprising in the province. Launched in January of 1960, this carefully coordinated series of insurrections achieved considerable success as insurgents seized isolated posts and captured local leaders. Some of the officials were executed. Others were set free after being warned. End quote. Their activities even included storming one of the fortified areas in which peasants had been relocated into, destroying it with the help of those who had been moved there. This would eventually prompt a response by Ziem's troops, but any land lost in this manner could only be regained with death and destruction. And that comes across in the, well, kind of standard view we might have absorbed about this part of the conflict. Indeed, maybe even generally about the so-called Vietnam War. Very much a kind of admirable, valiant effort. But it would be naive to talk about most wars in terms of good versus bad kind of framing. It's always about achieving certain aims and doing that in the most efficient way. But just like the war with the French, it was not as if the Viet Minh did not also resort to, what would we call it, the dark arts of insurgency. So if we were to compare the somewhat, you know, the more typically patriotic valence that we get from, say, Madame Din there in that example in the Mekong Delta, let's have a look at an account by a poor farmer who was actually living just adjacent to Bantre, where Madame Din's uh, engaging in this insurgency was taking place. So what is essentially just a different view of roughly the same events. This source is taken from Edward Miller's very handy set of primary sources about the Vietnam War. And it's worth mentioning that this particular farmer and his, uh, his interview in describing what the insurgency looked like in practice at this time, 
Well, he also became a party member after he had participated in the events that he describes, but the interview itself, in which he recalls these events, was conducted around seven years afterwards, and importantly, once he had defected back to the South Vietnamese government from the NLF. So there is a certain amount of bias that may or may not be there, as well as a potential that he was trying to distance himself from the activities in question. But either way, as Miller suggests, this source provides a fascinating glimpse into how the revolutionaries used persuasion and compulsion in order to enlist rural residents into the movement. Okay, with those caveats in place, it begins like this. Quote, The front started to operate secretly in my hamlet beginning in February of 1960. At first, the secret guerrillas carried out armed propaganda activities in the hamlet at night. They went to the houses of the family group heads and the hamlet chief and took them away for one or two hours to propagandize them. When they entered the houses of these officials to arrest them, only those with genuine rifles came in. Those with fake rifles stood outside. The people who were arrested and their families couldn't distinguish between the real and fake rifles. The family would be frightened and unwittingly make propaganda for the front by telling other people how the front was more powerful than it actually was. End quote. So he's basically saying there that they were able to, you know, uh, make themselves look bigger than they were in order to project this image of, of power onto, onto the rural populace. And I might just paraphrase the next part, where he basically says, apart from propaganda, the cadres also collected money, but they would come at night and say, turn off all the lights, and they would request donations. But they would have studied each family first to determine how much they should be giving. They would say it was voluntary, but the families would not refuse. They would also hang banners around, post up slogans, and give out leaflets. They would continue collecting money as well at least a few times. And not only did this give them, well, financial aid, but it was also making it so whoever was contributing was also committing an illegal act in the eyes of the government, making them guilty by association, particularly in light of the 1059 decree that we talked about. So naturally, the people contributing might also feel that they needed to lean toward the front for protection as well going forward. Basically, like putting someone's fingerprints on the scene and saying, well, you are part of this now, whether you like it or not. He comments about how the villagers were frightened from both sides, but they could see how easily the NLF was operating. And then he goes on to describe what happened in his hamlet when the actual armed uprisings began as well. Quote, When the front had just emerged and was destroying the government control, it arrested and killed nine people. They were all from the village. All these people were executed with machetes. At night, the cadres went to the houses of these victims, knocked on the doors, and then killed them with machetes without letting their families witness the execution. After killing these people, the cadres left a condemnation note on their bodies. No funeral services were allowed, and the families of the victims were left by themselves to bury the dead. No one helped them. And as an aside here, Miller adds a footnote to mention who these nine people were in the hamlet. Apparently one of the nine was killed because he was a drunk, two others for robbery, while the other six were killed because they were suspected of supplying information to the government. Continuing with his testimony, the farmer states that, quote, Besides the nine people that were killed, the front also arrested over 30 people and took them away for warning and thought reform for one day. They didn't detain them for more than a day because they didn't have a secure place to jail them. Those who were released had all been warned. If they committed the same errors again, or if they resumed working with the government, the front would kill them. End quote. And I'll just paraphrase him at the end here again. He basically says that the executions demoralized the people and produced the intended effect that they didn't criticize the killings and were worried that they might also then be suspected. That most of the villagers felt that the people killed had been innocent, but they were too frightened to do anything but go along. So 
like I said, I don't really want to undermine either side here. The fact of the matter is that this was a very difficult set of circumstances. And for your average person just trying to go about their business, the Ziem regime presented neglect and authoritarianism, and the new Liberation Front acted as an option away from that, but operated themselves within their concerns for their movement, and how to operate their oppositional state in the face of severe repression as well. Like I said in the intro, for me it just it feels appropriate enough to just feel sorry for everyone involved particularly when we put this in the context of the decades of instability and war that had gripped this beautiful part of the world. You just want it to be over for them. And unfortunately, a whole new terrible chapter is just beginning. Now, I've included this slight retreading into the beginnings of the insurgency, not only to just fill out some of the detail here that I felt was a little lacking in the first part of this little mini three-part intro into the conflict, but also because it gives us a little foreshadowing of how things will progress in the Cambodian Civil War as well. But let's just wrap it up slightly here before we move back to the US role a little more. So while the examples given are very particular, and certainly shouldn't be presumed to be how it functioned everywhere in the South, but if we just imagine this relatively gradual process, like that one that Bernard Fall had recognised, of, you know, hamlet by hamlet, this creeping spread of the NLF in rural areas, capitalising on resentment to the ZM regime, but also using their own tactics to support their movement in the process. And it's not hard to see that before long, these figures that will start being commonplace, where that the basically acknowledge that large regions of the rural south will no longer be under the complete control of the government. But this begs the question of what would happen if these same levels of dissatisfaction began to be felt in the urban areas as well. As Ziem became further convinced that he and his family were the only politicians capable of leading South Vietnam, personal loyalty to him became the most important factor in promotion in and around the government, military, and other relevant posts. Catholics also became the favoured group to draw upon. He and his brother Nu also began regarding even the trappings of a Western-style democracy, like the National Assembly and some kind of political debate, with a dismissive attitude. These things were a distraction. Some US analysts became wary of the possibility that further cloistering and this inability to engage with other political groups was leading to a lack of confidence in Ziem in the urban centres as well. Intellectuals, for instance, they felt utterly stifled by the repressiveness of the regime. Even those administrators who were given their positions in the first place out of an initial support of Ziem were irked by the rising nepotism and corruption that was now commonplace in South Vietnam. And we will return to the consequences of this later, particularly in regard to what this meant for the armed forces, as well as certain religious groups, like the Buddhists. But for now, the real issue was this relationship between tactics of repression to combat the now growing insurgency, but the backfire of those tactics, in that they fueled the insurgency further Increasingly, the only method that was being sought out was a military one. As long as you could shoot the communists, who cares what the peasants are thinking, or how hard their lives are becoming? But what? An interesting question that you might have already asked to yourself at some point listening to this is, well, why don't the US benefactors here simply make ZM be better? Well, it's not as if some of those operating in the country hadn't begun seeing the warning signs. One of those who was trying to bring these warning signs to attention was Ambassador Durbro. He was saying that the miracle of the ZM regime was increasingly becoming a mirage, and his thoughts were echoed by some in the military and CIA. But when he brought this to someone like Hang and Sam, it basically just descends into an argument. Hang and Sam says that he would be better suited to selling lady shoes than representing the US in an Asian country. The leader of the military assistance advisory group was adamant that the ZM regime was not in trouble, and that the guerrilla threat would not be a long-term concern. 
And now imagine if you were President Eisenhower here and you've got someone saying, look, the regime is kind of, well, it needs a lot of work. Things in the countryside and even in the cities are looking increasingly dire and without serious change, it will go bad. Or, on the other hand, you've got the military man who's coordinating so much of the work over there saying, no, it's fine. And there isn't even a real threat, so don't worry. Well, if you were Eisenhower, you might be inclined to go with the path of least resistance here. Especially when Vietnam was thought of as this increasingly small fish to fry. When tensions over Berlin with the Soviets, or more eye-catching the launch of the Sputnik satellite, might be drawing your attention. If someone came in with a bunch of quite difficult news, you might just say, Well, this other guy thinks it's fine, so we're just going to go with that. But there were those on the ground that were trying to get through to ZM himself, trying to point out that reform was necessary. And this is where that idea of, oh yeah, ZM was just a puppet of the US, kind of loses some traction. ZM and his family needed US backing, that's undoubted. They knew it, the US knew it. But the new family hated how much they needed that assistance. They truly did see themselves as genuine nationalists and deeply resented the tag of puppet. They kind of thought that the Americans just didn't really get it. They didn't understand Vietnam. For instance, once Nu, Ziem's brother and basically the second most powerful person in the state, told a South Vietnamese officer that the French, they might have been colonial masters, but at least they understood Vietnam where the US helps them with money, but doesn't understand Vietnamese affairs. So it's, it becomes kind of this codependent relationship, where the ZM regime is able to exercise a fair amount of autonomy in how it wants to handle things, because they know that there is no other suitable leader that the US could put in their place, and that the US was so staunchly committed to South Vietnam being this cap in the bottle against the spread of communism. They needed each other. And it's this phrase, this path of least resistance, which I've borrowed from Lojavol's Embers of War book, which does a lot of heavy lifting in explaining the US and South Vietnamese relationship in the late 1950s, and I would go further and say into the 1960s as well. I'll quote him here, actually. America's Vietnam planners chose once again to travel the familiar and easy and well-trod course, the course of least immediate resistance. They had opted to forge ahead and hope for the best, rather than face the unpleasant task of initiating a fundamental change in policy. Never blind to the obstacles standing in their way, US decision-makers through the decade of the 1950s stayed firm in their commitment to thwart Ho Chi Minh's revolutionary ambitions. Even if the odds for success were long, it was always safer, easier, in domestic, political, as well as geopolitical terms, to soldier on, to muddle through. Especially given that for America, the superpower Colossus, the Saigon commitment remained small, in both material and manpower terms. Ziem, for all his deficiencies, had beaten the odds before, perhaps he could do so again. End quote. And if it was at all my place to do this, which I don't really think it is, but you know, if we are to sort of point our collective historical finger and say, hey, that was wrong, well, yeah, I might rely on that kind of cliche movie scene that I referenced before. It kind of gets it across. We have people coming in and saying, look, this is getting bad. We need to do something. It's like in Jaws when the mayor is confronted with this evidence of shark attacks, and the response is kind of, well, hey, you know it's swimming season coming up. It's the holiday season. It's our biggest economic season of the year. It's kind of important for the town and me. And I'm basically going to pretend that you didn't say that that woman was killed by a shark. No widespread re-evaluation on the US role here or the potential to disentangle relations with CM, is undertaken by the end of the Eisenhower regime. And in, well, if we're being charitable, we could say what was unintended consequences of trying to keep things stable down there, 
particularly as this was only being framed as a military problem by many of his advisors, and it needed military solutions, well, Eisenhower acts on this and changes the function of the US military advisors on the ground. Before this point, any military personnel, United States military personnel in South Vietnam, well, they were actual advisors. They were confined to areas and roles in which advising was the, what they were doing. Eisenhower changes this, however, authorizing these personnel to be able to accompany South Vietnamese military on operations. Though not allowed to officially enter combat, but you can imagine the subtle difference from explaining to someone how to, I don't know, fix a car and sending them off to do it, as opposed to standing there next to them as they open the bonnet, sooner or later you are liable to hand someone a tool, help them open a gasket, maybe get a little dirty in the process. Before you know it, you're under the car and getting very hands-on. And it was in early July of 1959 when this, this up until now tacit entanglement with the civil war in South Vietnam became deadly for some of these advisors. Not since an isolated incident at the end of the Second World War, or a plane shot down delivering supplies to Dien Bien Phu almost a decade after that, had American servicemen been killed in Vietnam. North of Saigon, at a military camp, Major Dale Buis of California, who had only arrived two days earlier, and Master Sergeant Chester Ovnand of Texas, who was due to head back to the States having completed his tour. Well, they had finished up dinner and were relaxing among others in the dining hall and watching a movie. Just after it was completed, the lights still off to accommodate the projection, the six Viet Cong guerrillas that had silently moved into the barracks opened fire on those in attendance, just as Ovnand had switched the lights back on in order to change the reels of the film. Ovnand and Buis were hit immediately and died then and there. Another was seriously wounded. If it wasn't for another serviceman's quick thinking to turn the lights back off, perhaps more would have been slain in the same fashion. Those that survived could also count themselves lucky, as one of the Viet Cong guerrillas had these homemade explosives, but they had actually malfunctioned and killed themselves instead. Aside from that, a Vietnamese guard, as well as a cook and his eight-year-old son, were also among the casualties. The guerrillas, aside from the one who had met his end from the malfunctioning explosive, escaped before South Vietnamese infantry arrived. News of these casualties did not produce much of a stir in the US media, and it would have been hard to imagine at the time that Ovnand and Buis would mark the first two inscriptions that would eventually be followed by more than 58,000 more in the monument that would be erected in memorial of the Vietnam War just over 20 years later. Some analysts could sense that a new stage of the conflict had begun, no longer a slow creeping village-to-village -village insurgency, but that sufficiently armed, planned out acts of military action may become the new normal. And as South Vietnam gradually slid into chaos, visible to some, ignored by others, or expected to simply wilt in the face of expanded military might, eventually, well, the youngest president voted into office, John F. Kennedy, would have to contend with this issue as he was sworn in on the 20th of January, 1961, the same month that Edward Lansdale, the buccaneering CIA operative that we began this episode with, now a brigadier general, visited South Vietnam and reported back that, quote, 1961 promises to be a fateful year for Vietnam. The Viet Cong hope to win back Vietnam south of the 17th parallel this year, and are much further along towards accomplishing this objective than I had realised from reading the reports received in Washington. End quote. Until next time, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.